I think we have as leaders a responsibility to choose our story and what our legacy is going to be. And I'm of an age where I'm thinking legacy. And I think I have had to make choices to be angry or to be, to just get things done. I mean, you know, I can fight it legally or I can find a way to solve a problem. And I think sometimes we just have to choose that. And that's our individual story that we're crafting is, and I'm looking at what do I want to be known for? Who's the person I want to be seen as? And Leadership Story Talks, where we discuss the practices that engage, motivate, develop, retain, and attract people to businesses. We'll give you principles and tools based on real world stories to leverage listening and storytelling to become a better leader and management professional. Leadership Story Talks is produced by Narrative, a company that focuses on personal storytelling for business. Welcome to Leadership Story Talks. I'm Jerome DeRoy, CEO of Narrative. And I'm Julian Ryan, and it's great to be here and on our latest podcast. Thank you. Uh Absolutely. Uh, great to be back. Uh, so before we move on to introducing our guest, which I'm very excited about, I want to remind our listeners to subscribe to the podcast, leave a review uh, wherever you find your podcasts, and also check out our YouTube channel because the episode is also published on, on the YouTube narrative channel. And you can then go to narrative.com, N-A-R-A-T-I-V.com slash podcast, where you can find all of our previous episodes and anything you wish to know about this podcast. So without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome Catherine Carroll, who's a recognized subject matter expert by the U.S. Department of Labor, Office of Disability Employment Policy. She served as she serves as co-chair of Colorado's Innovative and Nationally Recognized Employment First Advisory Partnership. She's the past chair of the State Rehabilitation Council and the Colorado Developmental Disability Council. Her extensive career in helping individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities secure supported or customized employment, find need resources, and creatively navigate complex systems through organizational transformation with policymakers, providers, and working with patients of special needs children to find innovative pathways to prosperities for individual to prosperity for individuals with disabilities. She's the mother of Mikkel, who I've had the immense privilege of meeting. Oh. Her adult daughter with special needs, Mikkel has worked since she was 16, spoken to Congress and at the National Press Club on behalf of people with disabilities who want to work and make money, which can be difficult if they need Medicaid and Social Security benefits. Mikkel is nonverbal and uses an iPad for communication and a wheelchair for mobility. Together, Catherine and Mikkel host the Shining Beautiful series podcast, which I've been on and I highly recommend it. And they're regular bloggers on Mikkel's website, which is theshiningbeautifulseries.com. And we will make sure to post this in the episode notes as well so people can go there. Uh, finally, Ka Catherine also serves as a director on the board for the Washington Initiative for Supported Employment and on the board of directors for Imagine Enterprises in Texas. She's a co-founder of Families at the Forefront of Technology and a former organizational consultant at the University of Northern Colorado. Welcome to the show, Catherine. It's so good to have you. Well, thank You've you been for busy. having me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's quite an extensive uh, bio. And, you know, a lot of times I get very long bios and, and, and I sort of look for ways to uh, maybe edit them a little bit. I honestly didn't want to touch this one because there's so much that that is important in there uh, and everything feels essential. And I say that because you and I, Catherine, have a have a history. We've, we've worked together before. Uh, Catherine came to one of our webinars back in 2020, I think it was. And and then we actually worked together, um, uh, created an advocacy, storytelling for advocacy workshop. Um, and, and I remember this very well because we called it Adding Voice. And many people in the workshop were people with disabilities, um, and including your, your own daughter, Mikkel. And, and, you know, what we've come across before at, at Narrative uh, in the context of our work is that, you know, storytelling is this sort of uh, verbal, presentational thing that's for charismatic people who know how to command an audience, et cetera. And so when we, uh, we, we've tried to demystify this, I think most of our work, and I think Julian will agree, is mm. that it's actually much more democratic than that. And that storytelling is not just a verbal a piece of way of communicating, but there are many, many ways to tell a story. And this workshop 
was really a manifestation of that. You know, with people making art, with people who were singing and other, using their voices in different ways. Um, and so, so I've always really had a, a looking look back to that memory uh, with a lot of fondness and really admire the work that you've been doing along with Mikhail to further, you know, the the um, how should I put it to break down the kinds of stereotypes and preconceptions and assumptions that people have about people with disabilities uh, and how far you've come. So that's just my my extra piece of intro. Um, and I'm sure we'll we'll come back to the link between storytelling and the work that you do. But I'd love to hear from you, Catherine, to kick us off here in terms of your own background and how did you come to do all of this work that we that I just uh, that I just articulated in your bio? My well, life is interesting, you know, it throws you into these different directions. But um, my, it was my mother who got me started. Um, she said when she became a special ed teacher back in the, the late 40s, early 50s, and she was working in one of the schools in Denver called the Evans School. And she worked with kids that were struggling in school um, and not part of the regular classroom at that time. There was a period of time when Kids with significant disabilities, particularly, were either institutionalized or they were um, schooled in outside the school system. And it really wasn't until 1974 that the legislation changed that kids had a right to education. So I worked with my mom in one of those little segregated schools. Um, and she one summer, she said, you know, you and your sister need to find something to do. So I found you something. You're going to volunteer at the summer camp. And um, my sister did not do well with it. It was not her thing, but I fell in love. And I fell in love with this young girl named Carrie. She was one of these girls that had these, you know, just beautiful sky blue eyes and you know, corn silk hair and braided and, and she had autism. And, and I just connected with her. And I remember her mother, Carol, just being like walking sunshine. And because at first I was like, well, this is really sad that these kids have disabilities and, and these parents. And then I see Carol walking in with like, she owned the world. And I'm going, I may not be looking at this right. And then I, with, with Carrie and I met these parents who were just, you know, so positive and so engaged and they had big hopes for their kids. And I was hooked. I was hooked. And mm -hmm. um, I decided to get my degree in special education from the university of Northern Colorado, where I later worked. And um, I would work in the recreation programs in the summer with special needs kids and, and then went on to get my degree. But I had worked with kids with significant disabilities, but there was no educational degree for that. Hmm. And so at the time, I went to the university and I said, you don't know, you're not doing this right. <laughs> my mom does this better than you guys. And I can, I can do better. And, and so I don't want your degree. I want this degree. And so they crafted an independent study program for me. And I became the first teacher in Colorado to be certified. And in that time was called trainable men and retarded. We unfortunately moved on from a lot of those labels. <laughs> uh, but I really had an affinity to people who were not um that didn't have a voice, didn't were not yeah. seen, were not even allowed to be educated. Um, in a regular classroom or a regular school, even in a in a in a room in the back of the school, that that just bothered with my idea of social justice. And you know, it was the '60s when I was going through all this, and the '70s, and you know, civil rights movement was a big deal. And and I'm going, but they're not talking about these people. They're not talking about people with disabilities. And so through my the course of my um, my work, I, I I taught school in a segregated school when it was my first job, and um, and I loved it. And I I met a lot of people and who had some different ideas about how to educate. We were just trying to figure it out because those kids were not in institutions. And I had been to an institution as part of my education at the university, and I, you wouldn't want anybody to be in one of those places. They're not mm -hmm. they're not pleasant places to be. And, um, and parents did not want to send their kids there, which is what the medical profession often, even at that point, suggested, you know, just put your kid in an institution, kind of forget about them and go live your life. That was the kind of the standard advice that doctors gave to families. Well, families were kind of going, I don't think so. So they started these schools 
in church basements, which is where my mom's school started. And, um, and I just started seeing this movement of the community working to solve its own problems. And then gradually there became some funding to help support these and families would fight with the legislature to get funding for these forgotten kids in many respects. And you just saw this movement grow that happened to kind of parallel, but not necessarily intersect with um, the civil rights movement mm-hmm. at the time. And so mm-hmm. that's how I got my start. Now, what's interesting about that, that young girl that I fell in love with ended up being my daughter's roommate like 30 years later on a trip that they took through Easter Seals. And I, I, I'm i dropping Mikel off at camp and they're going to go to the Grand Canyon and to Las Vegas. And guess who's her roommate? It's the older version of this girl. Wow. And I see the mom coming up and I'm going, oh my God. And she goes, oh my God. <laughs> and it was so impactful to me um, because she was not doing all that well. The system had been kind of rough on her and life life, life can be tough with a disability mm-hmm. as you get older. And But her mom was still just uh, absolutely amazing. And it really stuck with me. And then there's an author named Andy, Andy Andrews who um, would go and speak to um, military bases during particularly the Iraq and Iran wars, conflicts and Afghanistan when soldiers didn't feel like they were making a difference. And he combined these stories to tell um, people that one person can make a difference. And so he kind of highlighted, you know, George Washington Carver and the teacher who made the, decided the outcome of the battle of Gettysburg and many stories like that. And I thought, who's that one person that made a difference in my life? Mm. And it was that that young girl, Carrie. Mm. And um, so I called her mom. And I said, I left a message. I said, I just want you to know that even though Carrie was not looking as as vibrant as she had as a young child, I want you to know she has served a purpose. And through the work that Mikkel and I have done, she has touched hundreds, if not thousands of people. And of course, Hmm. her mom called me back crying and said, that was the nicest thing that I'd ever said. (laughs) But it's those people that make a difference and change the course in our lives that are so powerful. They change who we are. They change our DNA. And Carrie was that person and my mom um, who shifted, you know, who who created who I became. And mm. and so, and I just am feisty enough to want to do it my way. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and you, yeah, go ahead, Jules. Sorry. I was, I was, one of my questions was like, what is the role of storytelling? Um, up to, even before you met Jerome and you know worked with that method, and I just think it's amazing to hear these backstories, and that you also circled back to somebody to show them what their ripple effect was. That we don't know, you know, the impact sometimes we make when we meet somebody or coach somebody, and the fact you did that, I think, was an amazing gift. And mm-hmm. um, that is a, a definite catalyst for anybody to say, you know, it made its purpose. So thank you for sharing that. You yeah. Were- yeah. I mean, I, I, I uh, yes, very similar kind of response to that, because how many times in our lives do we actually, number one, realize that someone made a difference in our in our life, right? That doesn't always happen. We don't always recognize that. And then number two, have the opportunity to 30 years later, meet that very person again And finally, you know, reach out to them like you did. Um, You know, I think it's such a good, um, such a great message for for everyone who's listening to this in terms of, yeah, pay attention. And you've said this very often, Julian, in our, in the context of our podcast and our work of just pay attention to those people that, that, you know, I think you've called them angels before, right? Like pay attention to those people who, who really make an impact in your life and make a difference and make sure to tell them. That, they, that they're making an impact. I think that telling them is the really important part. And I have another yeah. little story to tell you is that um, during, after 9-11 and when the anthrax thing was happening, uh, we lived in a, a different building that had a mm-hmm. regular letter carrier that would show up. And I could tell this guy had maybe been in the service at some point, really nice guy. And we were talking one day and he said, you know, I'm the first line. If that anthrax comes through, it's 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 me and I have to protect you. He says, I make sure you get your mail on time. I get your bills, your checks. He goes, your your love letters that you get and the cards that you get from your family is that I'm that person. So I was training a group of leaders in New Jersey and I had this idea. I said, let's thank 
this guy. So I had brought a bunch of thank you cards and stamps, and I had them all write individual letters to Bob. Bob was his name. Yeah. And, and so, and I didn't tell him about it. I didn't tell, I didn't mention anything. And so all this, and I had a mail to me addressed to Bob in care of Catherine mm. Carroll. And so they came to my mailbox and he's having to deliver these letters to him on Houston. <laughs> so he says, <laughs> what do you, he goes, you tell me what's going on here. <laughs> and I said, well, these are for you. And he says, well, what's this about? And I said, you are on the front line. We don't realize what a pivotal role that a letter carrier pays, particularly at that time, plays in our life. And I said, I just want you to know, I appreciate that. I appreciate how nice you are to Mikkel. And these people wanted to know how amazing you are. And he mm -hmm. just started tearing up. And he said, that's the nicest thing anybody said since my mom said something to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought... I'm so glad we did that. And unfortunately, Bob retired, which I told him not to do, and he passed away within the year. So this was a this was a crowning moment for him that his life made a difference. And he was impactful to other people, too. And mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. you know, those are the kind of stories that we we can share with people that get them to take action. Mm -hmm. And to me, a story's got to lead to some kind of action or feeling or reflection or or some something along those lines and um yeah so and, bob and, i still think about bob he was an amazing guy oh, and it builds aware i think story builds awareness because humanizing a situation like in all these years i have never thought about some books i read in grade school or high school like one book about karen who was a young woman who had disabilities and it just brought it to life. It wasn't just a building with a logo helping kids. It, it brought what was behind the story. Um, so thank you. And that is the beautiful thing about the postman because sometimes they're there, we want the mail and we, we need to pay attention to. So small moments make a big difference. Well, they do. And I think it, 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 folks with disabilities and Bob, um, have reminded me of the courage it takes of the everyday person uh -huh. to to show up in the face of sometimes adversity. Um, and I think that, you know, we we sometimes want a perfect world. And, and that's one of the things I love about disability and working in this field is that we're all disabled. It's just some people recognize their disabilities and mm. deal with them and others are afraid of them. And, and the reality is that we're either going to die or become disabled. So getting more comfortable with the conversation and being more honest with, this is my strength. This is where I could grow. This is what I may never be a model at six foot and blonde, you know, let me just accept who I am. And, uh, and so get into that self-acceptance. And I think in the day of social media, um, you know, it's, it's, we, we're striving for perfection. And, um, and one mm. of the things I think you begin to see the perfection in the imperfection. And I look at my daughter who I think is just amazing and she can work a room without saying a word. And if you want to learn about storytelling, she can do it without, without all the structure, without it, she will get her point across the right. Jerome. I agree. I agree hundred percent. I've seen it in action. Um, and you know, I, I think that also kind of, brings up for me well first i mean you've said so much in terms of you know just the 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 value and power of storytelling but i think there was something that you said you know about action that you know you 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 want to tell a story that's going to lead to an action and and what i've witnessed between you and mikhail and working with the two of you is that that seems to be very present for both of you you know mikhail seems also to be very uh directed in terms of where she's going she's pretty clear about that. Uh, and again, to remind people, I mean, she's nonverbal and it, yet it still comes very much across. Um, and, but I'm curious for you, Catherine, what is that, what was sort of, you know, when you talk about um, supporting people with disabilities, especially in terms of employment and, you know, getting their, their story across so that they get the job that they want to get. Um, well, let me ask you this. Is that what you're looking for? Is that the action 
that you want people to sort of take when you use storytelling in, in the context That's of your work? That certainly is part of it. And, you know, good job development, because I started um, helping people find the, their dream jobs back in the 80s when um, employers had never hired people with significant disabilities. Um, and I really honed a lot of my skills at that time. At the same time, I was raising Mikkel and Mikkel's um, insurance never covered any of her medical or her disability related expenses. So from the time she, and we made too much money for Medicaid at that time. So I had to, I honed my storytelling in raising money to pay mm -hmm. for wheelchairs mm -hmm. and therapy that once we were, you know, tapped out of all of our resources. And then I became single because sometimes this stuff can split a family apart and you can have different directions. And I'm going to put a plug in for the movie Ezra. If you have not seen the movie Ezra, it's current right now, but it really captures the parental experience about fighting a system that doesn't believe in your child mm -hmm. and that is what i had to do and um and that's what i did for employment is i had to use the power of story to get people who didn't have any expectations or want to have any expectations for my my daughter um to take action and support her and be part of the team and to be her her deputized advocate and yeah. to advocate for her and other people with disabilities and to give us some cash <laughs> to pay for some stuff <laughs> because we didn't have enough. And so, you know, we did that for 11 years. And so I learned that, boy, if I tell the story this way, people will get involved. If I tell it this way, they won't. Mm -hmm. So I it, it was a trial by error. Um, kind of, of thing. And, um, and I found that particularly when you're tying story to action, if you can give a definitive, this is how you can help to change that transit, you know, in storytelling, you have that, that transition, you know, that mm -hmm. transformation mm -hmm. process from, you know, normal, not normal problem, solve problem, you know, and so I gave them a way to solve a problem. And it wasn't going to take away her disability. It wasn't going to take away all the problems we have. But if it helped buy a new wheelchair, that was cool. You know, mm. you could sell some grocery certificates to help, you know, fund this the stuff. If you could talk to your pastor about, you know, do you, does a church have a fund? It was really one of those kinds of things. And then what was so beautiful about it is that people began to tell Mikkel's story without me. Mm. That's yeah. amazing. And yeah. they began to advocate. And that's when I noticed, wow, there's a power in this. Um, and you'd see money coming from the most unexpected places. And, you know, and I learned also that it isn't a direct path from story to outcome. It's you may have to tell that story 10 times. And it may be the 10th person or the, maybe it's the 20th person that says, ah, I get it. I know somebody that can help. And, and often that's all I ask for is like, do you know somebody that might be able to help us? And, you know, in that process, they, they tap into the giving side of their, their hearts. And then they tap into their brains a little bit and say, oh, I know so-and-so and so. And then when they unlock their social capital, that is often as powerful as opening up their checkbook or their, you know, their Venmo account. Um, and, you know, so they realize that they can make a difference. And that's the gift that we offer is that sometimes you don't feel like you can make a difference in the world. And yeah. for us personally, you know, contact with Mikkel lets people know that they can make a difference and, um, and that she, they and Mikkel can do some pretty amazing things together. Um, just like Mikkel and I have done some pretty cool things together. So it's um it's a partnership and it's a community and Mikkel's Korean name is Mi Chong um, or Mi Chong um, depending on uh, the non-Korean versus the Korean pronunciation, <laughs> 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 which is the literal translation is shining beautiful. Wow! Mm. And so what we look to do is that everybody that interacts with us, they have an opportunity to shine beautiful too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, so, and that led to your to your series 
the shining yeah. beautiful series yeah yeah, yeah. um julian you were gonna I, I do. I know we want to come back to the podcast, but I was just curious along the way when you're interacting with people, I, we, our goal is to have the story fester into people's heads and hearts and, and take root and not go away. What would you like people to be doing more of or doing less of when they're interacting with you and learning about the, uh, your daughter and the work you're doing? Not a great question. Um I think I'd like them to know it's okay to be curious. Mm -hmm. We've always looked at, um, you may not understand what you're looking at here. Hmm. Just give us a chance. Just give us a chance. Um, you know, just say hello. And that can often start the engagement process. And Mikkel can tell her own story very quickly. She had given you a bit, you know, you may have your own perception of Mikkel because she can't walk, she can't talk. She clearly has a disability. But when she whips out her business card or her podcast postcard or tries to sell you a bracelet within the first five minutes that you've met her, you immediately change your mind about who Mikkel is. And mm -hmm. you see this amazing, and you see that she, when she goes into a coffee house, everybody says hello to her, you know, and she's well known in her community. So I think, you know, the way we've been able to do that is that, that if, if people have a question, we'll say, what's your question? What do you need to know about mm -hmm. us? And I think we learned early on that you can't assume people know everything about you or the proper mm -hmm. terms for disability or all this. But if they're curious, then I, we have taken on our ourselves and not everybody feels this way. So, you know, you got to kind of feel your way through this is that ask a question. I don't expect you to know everything about the the disability movement, even as I don't know everything about other movements that are occurring in the, in our country and world mm. right now. But I can ask a question. I can ask permission to say, you know, I don't know much about this. Could you tell me more? What would you prefer? Because there are some people with disabilities that don't want your help, don't want your conversation, and there are other people that welcome it. It's just, we're just people. So we have yeah. to gauge it, not that we're a label, but we're a person first. And that's kind of where the employment first comes in and person-centered stuff that we have in our field is that we're people first. Disability is part of our experience, whether I'm a parent or I'm an individual with a disability. Um, it's look at us people first and then, you know, find something you have in common. Mikkel's got a Denver Broncos, uh, you know, sweatshirt on. Are you a fan of the Denver Broncos? Start there. <laughs> oh, if you're at the coffee house, what kind of coffee do you like? Those are some of the bridge questions that, um, or you can say, gosh, that's a fancy wheelchair you've got there. Um, you, there are a lot of different ways that you can engage without getting too personal. And mm. I think that's, if you're going to maybe err on the the side of, um, you know, over, over, Mm -hmm. is that you get too personal too fast and you want to know the details of somebody's disability and you know that that sometimes does not work really well and yeah interestingly enough that can be a regional issue too and i had a friend that was telling me that they traveled to another state um in the midwest and people were hanging on their child's chair and they were kind of getting they were they were getting way too personal and it's like a chair is somebody's body. And if you don't want somebody touching your body, don't touch their chair either. I mean, understand that personal boundaries are important, but use the same social etiquette that you would want somebody to, to speak to you with. Um, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. And before I give this mic back to Jerome, um, my phrase that came to mind that I wrote down is you help people see and be seen. That, mm. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and I and what I hope to do, and Jerome and I did this in our in our workshop with Mikkel, is we we're trying to get the tools of however you will need to tell your story. Let's make sure it's your story, not some professional's version, not even your parents' version of that. How do you tell your story? Mm. Um, yeah. So that you don't need all these people doing that for you anymore. There was a period of time when we kind of had to open the door for people. 
And um, and I certainly did that when Mikel was young. And, and the way I kind of explained it is that I was driving Mikel's car and I was opening the doors for her in that on that journey. I'd get her into the school system. I'd talk to the school system, give her a regular education. She was at that point not able to do those kinds of things. But after I got her in, she had to kind of start driving her own car and she dropped me off at the curb and she'd say, I need you now to come in. Um, but I wasn't there trying to micromanage her life. Um, mm -hmm. She, once she got in the front door, I was just kind of keeping an eye, making sure there was enough gas in the car and, and the air, the air in the tires for her to drive her own journey. And I think that's part of how she learned how to advocate for herself. And she'll tell you, she is the boss of her life and the boss of everything she's <laughs> <laughs> she's the boss and <laughs> and I love that she grew up knowing that she's the boss yeah yeah it's very um you know the mindset that you're adopting with all of this um and and again what I've experienced working with you as well is is, is empowerment you know versus we'll be doing everything for you kind of thing um so that the person themselves is actually the one you know there's a one of our principles uh at narrative and in storytelling is that you own your own story. Um, so, so that sense of ownership, whoever you are, whatever your circumstances are, it's always yours. And we always start with that. We always start with, you know, asking people, why do you need a story and why now? And just by asking that question, it's like, oh, you're asking me, <laughs> you know, uh, little old me here who doesn't think I have a story, you know, why I might need a story. So now it's making me think about that. And, and maybe it's even making me think about the ways that I can, tell a story about myself that feels like it's my own rather than what I think other people want to hear. Um, and, and that's, you've used this a lot throughout this interview, Catherine, you know, that you're, you're looking for common ground. Um, and even in the questions you're advising people to ask, um, these, I, I, we could very well be talking about the basics of networking and business, right? Just yeah, notice something exactly. about the other person mm -hmm. and comment on it. And that'll so show some common, common ground. It's not any different, right? And, and I love that approach um, because I think it's very similar to how we view storytelling, kind of full circle from where we started. You know, it's, it's, it's not this, this uh, thing that's just for talented charismatic leaders you know it's it's for everyone and and everyone can learn how to do that and feel like it's their own story and that you'll see these amazing actions that come out of it so uh speaking of that speaking of the outcomes I, i'm very curious about maybe if you could say a few words about the the shining beautiful series uh, i know how it came about but but what do you what do you discuss in these podcasts and how, how do you how, how do you see it well, I, I think you have to take a risk sometimes. And, you know, with podcasting, you, you know, it was like, I, we have so much information. And I was talking to my son, Casey, and he said, you know, you need to start putting this information in a place that where people can find it, find it, you can archive it, you can't be traveling around the country doing this forever. Um, and so he says, you ought to think about podcasting. And, and, and I'm of a generation that technology i have to work with technology i have oh. to um it's you know and so i had to do my research and i had to learn and what was beautiful about it is we hired a young woman with cerebral palsy who had her own podcast and then we hired her to coach us on how to set up our podcast which i love that because then we're building that entrepreneurial um spirit uh for other people with disabilities and she was an expert she'd show up at these podcast conferences and she knew everything it's like this is fantastic and so she really helped us um shape that and you can find interviews with her on that and her name is Wynn Charles and when um we've had a couple sessions with Wynn because she's gone through grief and one of the things that we don't talk about a lot in our culture is grief and when you have a disability you kind of have a thing called chronic grief and mm. you know there are new things that come up that make your disability fresh again um so it's it's um disability can be a challenge, whether it's a, a mental health challenge. It's not like it, it goes away. It's with you throughout your life. And there are different stages of life that feel more potent than others. So this notion of chronic grief um, is real. And mm. when, when, when folks are a little angry or agitated, 
it's because they may be experiencing grief in a very fresh way again. And, um, mm -hmm. and I'm guilty of, <laughs> I can feel it again too. There can be something that can trigger it for me. But for Wynn, um, it, I really wanted Mikkel and Wynn to share their experiences as women with disabilities who are leaders and who have been um, um, underrepresented in the conversation. And people with cerebral palsy, which is what Mikkel have, are usually at the bottom of the physical disability thing. If you see a movie called Crip Camp, which is a wonderful movie to see, uh, Judy Human is. Um, very responsible. She passed away just recently, a, a, a amazing um, advocate and leader um, and became part of the Obama administration. And they actually produced her movie Crip Camp because mm -hmm. we send all these kids to camp and Mikkel went to camp too, but hers was around oh. technology. Um, and they went to summer camp and to get some, kind of an approximation of what other kids got to go through. But even in that, she says in that movie that the folks with polio were at the top of the food chain and the people with CP because of their communication disabilities were not as able to tell their story. And so they were not as valued even within the disability community. And mm -hmm. so we have these little hierarchies that some sneak in and we're really doing our, a lot to try and, and bring people the tools that have trouble telling their story, the tools in order to do that. Yeah. But we, Wynn and, and Mikkel had never told their grief story. Hmm. And so Wynn had lost both of her parents and she's an orphan now. Hmm. And you know, now she was, you know, she had a stepmom that was helping her. So she had to leave her home of Aspen, Colorado, where she'd grown up and she'd had to leave her home to go to Arizona. And, um, but Aspen was not an easy place to live in when your family's not there. You know, there's one road out in the winter time and you can get some big snow um, she had the resources to live there, but she didn't have, um, couldn't get help because she couldn't pay enough because it's a resort. And so there were all sorts of complications, but losing her, her, the people that had believed in her and, um, and worked for her was, was a really difficult for her. And so Mikkel had lost a few people in her life too. So they talked about grief. So, well, that's one group we try mm -hmm. to have, um, a diverse group of people. We talked to Jim Warren, who has done fabulous storytelling for people um, uh, who are indigenous to this country. And he has a movie called Seventh Generation that has won all sorts of film awards. But we talked about his life as, as a warrior fighting for his Lakota people in South Dakota, mm -hmm. but also... Um, his father was in a wheelchair. So we talked about, and he does a lot of work with in the disability movement. So we'll talk about um, Shay Tannis. And we just did one with Shay Tannis and Jim Corey. Shay Tannis is, uh, knows everybody in technology and Jim's working with AI. So we'll bring in technology experts to Mikkel will interview them about the impact of AI on a person like her's life and what mm. opportunities that might be able to create because AI will run away without people with disabilities because AI picks up on what's on the internet mm -hmm. and yeah. repurposes it basically. But if there aren't positive stories about people with disability on the internet, then, and if providers and people don't understand it, then people with disabilities get segregated in a 21st century way, which has yep. been a topic of my conversation for 20 years. It's like, are mm. we creating 21st century segregation? Cause we're afraid of technology and, and we don't see people with disabilities having an active role in technology. And, and the truth is we still don't. Yeah, I don't yeah. I think, that's one story I, I cannot yeah. tell well enough yet. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, you know, it, it, what this all shows me, I mean, first of all, what an amazing resource for people uh, this series that you've created is. And, um, and again, I've, I've witnessed and experienced all of this and I can really you know, like you. testify to all of it. So yeah, exactly. I've been on the show and it's really fantastic. Um, uh, you know, the, the other thing, and just in terms of AI as well, I mean, that's that's a subject that we've covered as well on this podcast because of it, it's sort of limitless in terms of the impact um, of technology, of, you know, you know, uh, not just AI, but it's part of technology. Um, and so I think it's it's so important to have people like yourself asking these kinds of questions. You know, are we? Because that's really the big deal: is 
what are we including in the mm -hmm. AI, uh, you know, in technology and what they're researching, who's actually putting stuff out there that then these AI tools can pick up uh, because they're not, AI is not generating anything out of thin air. It's generating stuff out of what exists. And so if those stories don't exist online um, and they're not readily available, then AI doesn't think they exist at all. And that's that's as good as saying, or as bad as saying, these people don't exist, you know? Exactly. And I think that goes all the way back to to really the, for me, the the true nature of, you know, why do we tell stories? It is, you know, so that people know that we exist and, and that our issues exist and that we can actually do something about it. So if we don't hear these stories, nothing can happen. Um, I, I'm looking at the time and know that uh, we, we unfortunately have to end soon. And there is one question that I, I, I want to make sure we ask because we ask of this of all our guests. Um, and that is, Catherine, what is an experience that you've had that st that has shaped who you are today, still informs you and influences you in some way? Well, it's obvious, but it's true. It's, it's you know, my mom and my daughter um, mm -hmm. both shaped me and my son too, um, because I think um, clearly, you know, and I've had professionals and colleagues that have shaped me and I've been so blessed to know a lot of really smart people who are very generous with their knowledge and I've been able to learn. But let me, let me take it back even further. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm going to take it back to Aunt Bernice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Aunt Bernice okay. was a pioneer woman, um, and her whole family, that side of the family, pioneered um, an Aspen steamboat and um, Leadville. And so they they came to Colorado when there wasn't much there, but a lot of poverty and a lot of courage to break into something new. I was surrounded by a group of people and as as Aunt Bernice's siblings, but Aunt Bernice lived to be 95. And one of the things that I learned from her and her siblings and my mom particularly was um, you come up with the answer. You don't stop. You be curious. And if you, as long as you're curious, and you're asking questions about, well, that's interesting. How can I do this? Um, or you can take the worst times of poverty and everything, and you can still find the most beautiful flower in the valley. Mm -hmm. It's those kinds of things that you can choose to let yourself be awful and your or your experience in life to be awful, or you can choose to celebrate the things that you have. And, and be curious about this as a child. And I think that's why I'm not afraid of AI in, in, in terms of approaching. And I'm curious about AI. Um, I'm curious about innovating things. I'm not afraid to ask for what I want anymore. And so I can go to policymakers and I can say, you know, we can do better. Well, I don't know that we can. Oh, yeah, we can. Let me show you how. We're going to do it better because these folks deserve to have better. And you have the resources to make that happen. So let's figure it out. And, and fortunately, I live in a state where people are very gracious um, and giving me access to talk to them about what's not happening. And, um, and I'm very grateful for that. But I think Aunt Bernice really hit a home run there. I really I do. It. I love wow. it. Uh, yeah. The, the, and it's great to... You know, as soon as you said it, let me tell you about Aunt Bernice. It's amazing what our brains are designed to do, right? We immediately lean in and want to learn more about this person because it, it is a person. And, and and I think that's kind of the through line that I'm getting throughout this interview is that for you, uh, and I think we have this in common, Julian and me as well, it's all about people, really. Uh -huh. um, you know, that behind the stories, behind the legislation, behind these actions, whatever it might be it's it's everything affects people and it, and it really strikes me that that's where you start and you're you bring your curiosity to that so uh i, I really want to thank you for for all the work that you do you do and continue uh, one to do more comment before yeah please go ahead i want to go back to what julian has behind her and and live um i i can't see it that well live a great story i think we have as leaders a responsibility to choose our story 
and what yeah. our legacy is going to be. And I'm of an age where I'm thinking legacy. And I think I have had to make choices to be angry or to be, to just get things done. I mean, you know, I can fight it legally or I can find a, a way to solve a problem. And I think sometimes we just have to choose that. And that's our individual story that we're crafting is, and I'm looking at what do I want to be known for? Who's the person I want to be seen as? And, and that informs me today because I have, Mikkel has a lot of personal care support um, and she has a lot of young women that work for her. And I see myself trying to be a story that they can emulate in a time of uncertainty. And because of my experience with Mikkel, I have dealt with uncertainty um, in some pretty strong ways. And that helps me mentor the next generation who is walking into a world that they haven't necessarily been prepared for. Mm. And so I think our stories can impact other people. Mm. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much. It's, this has been so important on so many levels, what you've been sharing. And yeah, uh, I, absolutely. I know I'm many so honored people to be so a part of this. <laughs> we'll take a lot of a lot of things. You've you've been finding the gift in situations and how you've shown up has changed uh, how people listen to you and how they listen yeah. to your daughter because of that choice and what you decided to do and how to do it. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank yeah. you for your for acknowledging that. And thank you. I mean, I love what the work that you all are doing. And, um, and that's what drew me to that, that webinar for all those years ago. I came in late. I came in late. <laughs> and Jerome was looking for examples and nobody said anything. I said, well, okay, then <laughs> I have an opportunity here to tell my story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's how it starts. Yeah. Yeah. So, but thank you so much for having me. I really am honored. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm very thankful for for you taking the time to do this and for being on our show. Uh, and as always, I'm thankful to you, Julianne, for co-hosting with me. Uh, yeah, thanks. And thankful to our listeners. Uh, thanks again for for being here. And if you want to learn more about Catherine and her work, you can certainly go to theshiningbeautifulseries.com. That's where you'll find the podcast and many other resources. Um, and we'll we'll add to in the show notes. You'll you'll also see many resources there that you can go to. And if you've been inspired by this, we talked a lot about storytelling and how to tell your story and what's impactful about telling your story in a variety of different contexts. Uh, you can go to narrative.com, N-A-R-A-T-I-V.com. And please consider enrolling your team or, or yourself as a, in a one-on-one -on -one session with us. Uh, we're always here to listen and uh, happy to help you craft and tell a story that's going to be creating an action like we talked about today. Um, so again, narrative.com and narrative.com. Don't forget to post a review and subscribe if you haven't already. Many, many other things that you can do uh, on all these websites. And, and we really look forward to, to seeing you or uh, being with you once again at our next episode. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you next time. For more information on the narrative listening and storytelling method and how it can help your business, go to narrative.com.